Welcome back to the Triple Threat Podcast. My name is William Zell, and joining alongside me today is Ishan Sheth. What is up? And today, we are doing a very special episode, our first ever NFL Mock Draft 1.0, coming to you the day before the draft, or if you're watching this on draft day. But we got a lot to go through, three-round mock, 150-player, big board, position rankings, and we're going to be going through every team. If you want to skip straight to your team, the description will be in the below with the timestamps if you want to skip to it. Preferably, you watch it all, but I understand this is a long episode because we're doing such an in-depth detail because I want to share with what I've researched and scouted to you guys. I mean, it's my opinion, and you don't have to take it. This is just what I think should happen. Quick disclaimer, this is not what I think will happen. This is what I think should happen if I'm the GMs, so it'll help me help me as the talent evaluator. I look back on the past on this episode. So let's just get into it. Arizona Cardinals at number one. And to me, there's only one number one player in this draft class, and it has to be Quinnen Williams out of Alabama. You could say that Kyler Murray could be the number one pick outside of realism, but I think the gap between Josh Rosen and Kyler Murray is not as great as Quinton Williams versus anyone on that Cardinals defense. What he can do makes him the best defensive tackle prospect coming out since Aaron Donald. 6'3", 285, and what he does is he absorbs double teams, allowing for his, uh, po- uh, his fellow defenders to have open looks to the quarterback. His double moves as his... Um, club to swim move combination is so fluid i've only seen one other defensive tackle do it as fluidly as him and that's aaron donald he just blows pie defenders and it's a mayhem it will mess up every play he can play all three downs and he will be an instant impact on this cardinals defense and in this division with russell wilson um jared goff and obviously jamie garoppolo they need some edge press some defensive pressure on the quarterbacks and quinnett williams is the guy to do that yeah, I do agree that Quinton Williams is the best player in the draft, but in my mock, I still have Kyler Murray going number one. Moving on to the number two pick, you have the San Francisco 49ers selecting Nick Bosa. How come? I mean, Nick Bosa is the most unbust proof um, player in this draft. His skill, is his size, his talent. We've seen a player so similar with his brother. We know what he's going to bring to the NFL. He's going to feast off smaller and weaker offensive tackles. But because he has such great hands and uh, burst off the line, he will get to the quarterback with his phenomenal moves. But the problem is against tackles with longer arms, he can disappear because he doesn't have the, the reach to get past him with his moves. He doesn't have the pure athleticism to get past them like a Montez Sweat. And that's why I think that he's going to feast off the, the lower end of the NFL. But he's not better than Quinn Williams because he can't dominate everybody. But you, that's why you have to switch him around the defensive line to create mismatch. But when there's no mismatch on teams like the Saints with two amazing offensive tackles, he's going to be completely... Um, invisible, like we saw in the Patriots game with Joey Bosa, but we saw in the in the game before with the Ravens, he could blow up. And Nick Bosa does have some injury concerns. He only played a couple games this season and sat out the rest. I also uh, question his football desire to play the sport, but overall, he cannot bust. He's the most unbust proof player in this draft, and that's why he is such a great player. And you have to take a number two because his floor is so high. All right, at number three, you have the first big trade. You have the Jets trading with the Giants, and the Giants move up three spots to select Kyler Murray. Explain the justification of this trade and what the Jets getting in return. So first of all, I think the Giants will trade up to get Kyler, because once they realize the Cardinals haven't taken him, this is the best quarterback project we've seen in a while. He has the best leg and arm in this draft class, in my opinion. I don't care about his height because we've seen in the NFL we're transitioning to smaller, more athletic quarterbacks. And we've seen with players like Russell Wilson that doesn't matter what your height is as long as you can get around the pocket and create great throws. Kyler has the patience and pocket awareness to be a great passer as well as the legs to be an NFL running back. So to have that versatility makes such an amazing and dangerous prospect. And when the Giants realize that they could take this guy who's great for their brand being in New York and be great for their football team, you have to make this trade. So they trade by their first round pick, the sixth overall pick and 17th, as well as their third 
put him at three spots to get there, man. And I think Kyle Fletcher's a dangerous player. I loved him at the beginning of this season. I love him now. I've been really high on him. And if there's one strength I have, it is a quarterback analysis, I'd say. I don't want to boast myself too much, but I do think I have a good eye for quarterback. And I love Kyler Murray in this draft class. He gets the opportunity to learn behind Eli Manning, who's one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time, and has won two Super Bowls. He'll teach him how to handle the media in New York. And I, I heard your grunt about one of the best of all time, but you can't argue that Eli Manning is not a top 15 quarterback of all time. All right. So at number four... You have the Oakland Raiders was such an Oakland pick in my opinion. You got Devin White, the linebacker from LSU. I mean, the thing with Devin is his talent is one of the top in the draft, and that's why you have to spend such a great pick on him. Is because the ability is there, and he has the lateral quickness to make plays all over the field. He can get in the backfield. He can go laterally, side to side, numbers to numbers, and create plays everywhere. He's such an amazing middle linebacker, and he shows up on every play on the playbook if you look back on the tape. It's unfortunate that we didn't, <coughs> that we didn't get to see him in the first half of the Alabama game, but I think against an offense that great, he did show some promise, and I think that he will transfer to the NFL, and with with Burfick being on a one-year contract and the addition of Brandon Marshall, they need some guy to solidify this linebacking core. And this defense has been so poor. And I think him and as well as Terrier Whitehead should be a great linebacking duo. I love what Devin White can do. I don't know if this is the right fit, but if he finds the perfect fit defensively, he can be one of the best linebackers in the league. I don't think Oakland is that fit for him, but I know Oakland will take this pick, and I love it for Oakland. Let's see if they use him in the right way. I don't know if Oakland can get the best out of him, but let's hope for the best. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And... I I had them reaching a little bit. I had them reaching three spots because I have Devin as my seventh player on my big board. Yeah, so that's a rise of uh, three. Uh, At number five, you have the Kentucky edge rusher Josh Allen to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Why Allen at five? I mean, Allen (coughs) has solidified himself as the second best pass rusher at 17... (coughs) Excuse me for a second. I, he had 17 sacks last year for Kentucky. He has good size at 6'4", 230, and it's been bulking up every year. And his love for the sport is unquestioned as his motivation is for his son. And also being a two-star recruit, say he can be the next uh, Khalil Mack to go from a two-star recruit to an NFL superstar. And he has all the tools to do, though. He's freakishly athletic. You could stand him up as an outside linebacker and put him in the box in a uh, three-point stance as a three technique. I think he has the versatility to be great. And on this Tampa Bay defense that's ranked 30th in the NFL the past couple of seasons in defense, I think if it can immediate impact, especially with the loss of Vinnie Curry, I think that him alongside um, JPP and Vita Vea, because obviously they might be losing Gerald McCoy, I think once Arians comes, he's going to boost the offense, and they need somebody to boost their defense, especially with the loss of Deion Buchanan, which was a huge loss. So I think that Josh Allen, he's the best player on my box, my uh, big board available, and I think the Bucks were looking to trade out, but Josh Allen fell into their laps, and they just have to take him. At number six, the New York Jets, uh, via the Giants, due to that trade, pick up Jawan Taylor, the tackle from Florida. Why did you choose Jawan Taylor? He's a big dude. He's going to outmuscle anyone that comes up against him. 6'5", 334. I think that he could be one of the greater offensive tackles in this draft class. I think he has the potential to come in, start, and be great immediately. I think that they need to protect their golden goose in Sam Darnold, and he should definitely do this. Um, I like the offensive moves that they did surrounding uh, their offensive line this offseason. Getting Kalechi also melee on a cheap, cheap trade, a fifth-round pick. Basically, for not basically traded nothing to get one of the best offensive guards in football. I love what they did. Kalecha Osamele alongside Jawan Taylor should solidify this offensive line and open up holes in the run game. And Sam Darnold did not have a good weapons last season. His best weapon was Chris Hurd on at tight end and Robbie Anderson. And I think this season, once he gets an offensive line, an actual offensive line, which could be top half in the league after Jawan Taylor and Kalecha Osamele, could be a potential great fit for uh, Sam Darnold and I think if they get one more threat receiving wise in this draft or a running back, uh, they got Le'Veon Bell who should help him in the passing game as well so I think that 
this this team is ripe for offensive success, especially in the division that is a little bit on the weaker side, but strong defensively. I think that they need this um, tackle to solidify the offensive line because if they want to win this division, you have to build with the offensive line first. Yeah, I totally agree. Having a solid offensive line and picking up guys like Taylor and Osimeli will open up a whole world of possibilities. And now you have a dynamic running back that can not only run, but can open up in the field and catch passes. I feel like that's a really good target for Sam Darnold. Now at number seven, the Jacksonville Jaguars add another weapon for Nick Foles and TJ Hawkinson. I mean, the reason I have TJ Hawkinson as my best tight end in this draft is that what he does as a blocker is so phenomenal. He can basically come in and solidify the offensive line as well as helping in the receiving game. And I think that's what they need, especially with the injuries they received last season. I think if they have a healthy offensive line, Hawkinson can make it even better because Hawkinson's ability to block is so un it's incredible to see someone who's so good at blocking and receiving. And his passing his catching style is so similar to what Nick Foles needs to be a successful quarterback. And with the limited weapons that the Jags have outside of DJ Chark and Keelan Cole, I think that they need another receiving asset and there's no receiver I value high enough to take this pick and there's no uh tight end besides Hawkinson that I can value taking because of his blocking game makes him such a valuable player and I think Hawkinson can be such a phenomenal player in this scheme. I love him going to the Jaguars. This is a perfect fit. It might be a little bit of a reach. I have him at nine on my big board, but I think it's well worth it in the long run because a tight end is a poor in a position when you have Nick Foles as your quarterback. Just look at Zach Hurts last season. Now, you said that TJ Hawkinson was at nine on your big board. Is there a possibility of them trading down with maybe Buffalo or Denver to get Hawkinson at a later pick and get more assets? Or is there even a possibility of them trading down to the teens and get a wide receiver prospect? I think that the trading down to a receiver prospect is more likely. I don't think the Broncos or Bills have reason to trade up. I think the Bills are actually looking to trade down. I think the Broncos don't have a reason to trade up outside of a quarterback, which they seem content with Joe Flacco as of right now. But we'll get to that later. I think right now the Jags are stuck where they are. If they want to get a pick, I think they have to take the best available which is either Ed Oliver, which I don't see as a direct need now, but in a couple of years, they are going to need a defensive tackle, and Ed Oliver's skill set is so impressive. So this was either between Hawkinson and Ed Oliver, and I want for the immediate impact right now, because I want Nick Foles to be a successful endeavor in Jacksonville, because they were an ASC championship team a couple of years ago. Yeah, I totally agree, and speaking of Ed Oliver, you got him going at number eight to the Detroit Lions. I mean, I love what their defensive tackles are, Deshaun Hand, Nashawn Robinson, and they have Snacks Harrison, but Robinson and Snacks coming off the contracts this season, and they can't afford to pay both of them with only $43 million left cap space, so I think that getting the best available prospect, I have, um, I already say I have Ed Oliver at six on my big board, he was a consensus top pick, top three pick a season ago, I think that his athletic ability to play both tackle and edge should make this defense incredible, especially with Matt Patricia. Put an edge of uh, with Nashawn Robinson, Snacks Harrison, Deshaun Hand, and Eric Flowers alongside Ed Oliver. This could be the scariest defensive front all of football, and you need this in the NFC North, and I think this could be a perfect Matt Patricia defense. I think you have the best available on Ed Oliver because you don't know what he can be because the ceiling is so crazy mm -hmm. high. Yeah, Ed Oliver's ceiling is crazy. I remember him like 10 months ago. People had him in the top five, even in the top three, and he did not perform this that well because of the injury of the season, and he slid down to number eight. Obviously, he fell out. And he fell out with the coach there yeah. in uh, Houston. That yeah. was also a problem. And I think he could be the steal of the draft at the number eight spot. At number nine, you have the Buffalo Bills bolstering their line with Andre Dillard. I mean, the Bills made some good free agency moves on the line. And so they have no weakness after creating such a great free agency class. They obviously brought in... Um, uh, um, Mitch Morris out of Kansas City and Tynus Deche. 
uh, to solidify their offensive line, but I think tackle is still a problem. If they really want Josh Allen to be a successful quarterback in Buffalo, I think solidifying the offensive line is crucial, and that's why I have the day Andre Dillard. He's my uh, highest-rated offensive tackle left, and I don't think that they can value a guard like Jonah Williams is high enough to take him. I think solidifying that for their run game in Josh Allen and in LaShawn McCoy and Frank Gore, I think it's extremely important. I think that if they want Josh Allen to be successful, they're going to need him to have time in the pocket for him to make decisions because he's not the quickest decision maker. He has such a great talent with his arm, with his legs. So I think solidifying the offensive line is what they can do, which is best for their long-term future right now. Even though it's a little bit of a reach with five picks up my big board, I think that this is a much, much needed offensive line help. Yeah, I totally agree with that. They added a new running back to pair with McCoy, and I think adding another tackle, adding a tackle, will definitely help their offensive line and their running game. So at number ten, you have the Denver Broncos taking a quarterback whose name is not Dwayne Haskins. You got Drew Locke at number ten. I mean, on my on my position rankings, I have Drew Locke as number two, and I think that he fits the Denver scheme a lot better than Dwayne Haskins does because he's a bigger quarterback with more athleticism and I think in Denver that's what you need with the little amount of air there I think that he's his potential is probably the greatest we've seen in a long time outside of Kyler Murray I think what he can do is incredible with the ball and with his legs but the problem is his decision making is so poor and he just makes some stupid throws that you don't understand how we can make them while being such a talented player but he can pinpoint balls perfectly and I think that with Corlin Sun, he could be a phenomenal player. I really like Drew Locke in Denver and with um, Vic Fangio as their uh, new head coach. I think that this is a perfect fit. He can sit behind Joe Flacco and learn from him. He has won a Super Bowl before, which is <coughs> really good for a young quarterback. And so I think that learning under Joe Flacco will be important for him. And Drew Locke is perfect for Denver, and that's why I'm taking him here. But his potential is so crazy high, you can't ignore him. I like him a lot better than I did Jared Goff coming out of out of um, college. And they both have that same decision-making problem, trying to force the big play. And I think that comes with the lack of weapons Mizzou had and still being in the SEC. And he's trying to do everything by himself. And when he gets to the NFL, he realizes that he has to rely on his teammates more than he does himself. And I think that'll help him as a prospect. But watch out for Drew Lockman. This kid is special. His arm is one of the best we've seen. I think if he was in last year's draft class, the only guy with a better arm than him would be wow, Josh Allen. that's a bold statement. Now at number 11, we got another big arm. We got Dwayne Haskins going to Cincinnati, and I totally agree. I do not feel that Andy Dalton is a long-term quarterback. I mean, the Red Rocket cannot be relied on with Zach Allen's new offense. I think Zach requires a guy like Dwayne who has the arm talent to make big throws, but most importantly, he's 21 with the patience of someone like Tom Brady. He will dink and doink you to death and with those five-yard passes, which he hits his receivers like Paris Campbell in perfect stride. Like You might say that they were wide open, but there was a reason. The ske they schemed him open, and he threw perfect passes. They never missed a step in their stride when Dwayne Haskin was throwing. I think he's a great passer. His athleticism is going to be a problem behind the Cincinnati offensive line. But with Joe Mixon and Dwayne Haskins, I think that this can be a successful combination. And I think with the first-year head coach in Zach Allen, who is such a quarterback whisperer as he's claimed to be, uh, being uh, part of the um, Sean McVay tree, which is already forming, which is crazy. I was still in his 30s and already has a coaching tree. That is incredible for me. And I think that he can expect some big things out of him. I really like what Dwayne Haskins can do. And his patience is way beyond his years. I think that he can come in and be an immediate starter. But he does have that ability to sit behind Andy Dalton for one season and then come in and release his full potential. And I think Zach Allen is... This is the perfect fit. Cincinnati is the perfect guy. He's not going to be leaving Ohio. I love what Dwayne Haskins can do. And obviously there are some red flags with the athleticism, but his arm is too yeah, special to pass Yeah, and remember, they on. still got A.J. Green, so that's another great... He is rumored to be trade, traded, though, which yeah. is a problem, though. At number 12, we have a bit of a surprise. Most guys have him going in the second or third round. Hakeem Butler... 
Hakeem Butler is such a volatile prospect, and people have a value as high as the first round and as low as the third round, but his intangibles are the best we've seen since Calvin Johnson, in my opinion. I don't think he's Calvin Johnson esque, but being six foot six, a four four forty with incredible hands, I don't think you can pass on that. He also has a thirty six inch vertical and a eighteen bench press. You can't pass on a guy this special. He has the hands, speed, and size to be a phenomenal player. And with Aaron Rodgers, he's going to be unstoppable for the Packers. Deont uh, Devonta Adams is this one of the top five receivers in the league. He will take the whole defense, and Hakeem Butler will thrive under Matt Lafleur. I love him as a prospect. He has everything I look for. He has size and length. He has long strides. He climbs quickly to get on top of the safety from the slot. He uses his frame to create space, and he will catch every 50-50 ball. He has fine body control, and he's extremely physical with the ball. He's not afraid to go push a corner and go get the ball. He has, cr he has good toe taps as well, which is important for the new NFL, and he has the frame to be phenomenal, although there are some weaknesses in his game. He has uh, short area quickness problems, and he has his route running on the, f is a bit telegraphed, but if he's a second option with Aaron Rodgers as the quarterback, the possibilities are endless in this offense. I don't think that there's another receiver outside of DK Metcalf that's as freaky as him, and I think, obviously, Marquise Brown is probably the first receiver off most people's board as long as DK, but Hakeem, in my opinion, is the best receiver in this draft. He'd be the best receiver in last year's draft. He is my big, bold prediction for this offseason and this draft class. I love Hakeem Butler, and this is the perfect fit for him, and if they want to make this offense work, Hakeem Butler will be the key yeah. to it. So, at number 13, we have the Miami Dolphins selecting Dexter Lawrence. Why don't you have them selecting a quarterback like maybe Daniel Jones? I mean, personally, I don't think that this is a slot that I value a quarterback high enough to take with this pick. I would take someone with a higher floor and... I have Dexter Lawrence as my 11th guy on my big board, and so he's the best available outside of Jeffrey Simmons, but that ACL injury is going to be a little bit concerning for a team that is going to be bad this year, so I am going to not rush any to anything, and I'm going to take Dexter Lawrence, the big guy at a Clemson, 6 foot 4, 340 pounds, and what he can do is absolutely phenomenal. I think that he could just come in and mess up everything. I think with Brian Flores as the head coach, the possibilities with him is going to be phenomenal. He's going to be stepping up and trying to replace the uh, the void left by Cameron Wake and Adama and Sue that they've lost over the past couple of seasons. And to build this type of defense that Brian Flores wants to run, I think Dex Lawrence is going to be the key to it. And getting him at the 13th pick is a good value in my opinion, and that's why I have to take him because he's my best available player without any red flags like Jeffrey All right, Simmons. at number 14, we got my team, and this is a pick that I find very intriguing. You have Byron Murphy to the Atlanta Falcons. So I'll talk about why I like this, and then I'll let you talk about if you think that this is good as a Falcon fan and from a Falcon fan's perspective. I think this is a little bit of a reach, plus three spots on my big board, but... The only cornerback duo in the entire NFL not to record a single interception was the Falcons with their uh, two, Desmond Trufant and um, Robert Alford. Zero interceptions. And I think he's the best available player right now on my big board. I think Byron Murphy, out of Washington, he has the size at six foot and the speed and ability to cover. His feet are phenomenal and his coverage ability is great. I love what he can bring to the team. And I think that he has the ability to come in and be an immediate starter on this defense. And I think that cornerback is an underrated position of need for the Falcons. And I think that this is why I have the taking them. Um, what Murray gives up with this size, he has only 5'11", my bad. He's not a great size, actually. But he has press coverage ability and he's crazy potential. He has crazy speed as well to get to the spot and beat a wide receiver there. And I think that... He could be a important asset to this Falcon secondary, who did lose some yeah. key assets last so season due to injury. I actually, in my mock, I have Christian Wilkins going to the Falcons. Little spoiler, but why I don't like Byron Murphy is something that you said. I don't like the fact that he's undersized. 
I feel like we need bigger, longer corners because we do end up getting um, exposed by guys who are like 6'4", six, 6'5", six, with crazy verticals who are just aerial threats. Uh, guys, like a guys like AJ Green are come, come to the Falcons and they um, like run all over us because we didn't have someone tall or someone long that could actually cover them. Now, we did let go of Robert Alford, but we have Isaiah Oliver coming in. And Isaiah Oliver is a bit bigger, he's a bit longer, his wingspan is longer. And I feel like we should get, give him and Trufant a chance before we jump to any conclusions and have to find a replacement. And I agree with that because the NFC South does have big receivers um, with Mike Evans and Michael Thomas. And I think that's going to be important. But the speed receivers really developing in the NFL is becoming the more valuable weapon. And I think having a corner that can cover the speed receiver is much more important. So I think that's why I have Byron Murphy this high and as a good fit for the Falcons. All right. At number 15, we got the man himself, DK Metcalf. Why you have him going to Washington? I think the biggest need, the worst receiving core in football has to be the Redskins. And if they want Case Cam to have any success this season, they're going to have to give him some help because on the defensive end, their defense is pretty stout and was performing as a top 10 defense until the middle of the season when some injuries fell through. And I think that they could be a phenomenal defense unit. So I think that takes the defensive players off the board. They have a solid offensive line, great running backs. Uh, there's no quarterbacks high enough for me to take them here. And so I take a receiver that has the upside to be one of the best receivers we've seen in a long time. His combine was phenomenal, but he did have some issues. His 3 co was in the 3rd percentile. His 30-yard shuttle, I mean 20-yard, 30-yard uh, shuttle was in the 3rd percentile. And we saw with Calvin Johnson who didn't take those, but he had freaky athleticism everywhere except for uh, lateral agility. And so... Dick is going to run the same four route. He's going to run a short slant, a post, a fly, and then he's going to run a little like a post, uh, a corner route. And he will feast off all of those and maybe some hitches thrown in there. And that's what Calvin did. He run those four routes every single time. But at Ole Miss, DK was clinically misused. He was only given goes and posts. Two routes, and he was, AJ Brown, he was used to give AJ Brown more space. AJ Brown's a phenomenal player, but they were misusing DK Metcalf. He's proven that he's coming back from that neck injury, which is a big red flag, but DK has the upside to be one of the best receivers in this class, and I love this receiver class. I know most don't, but I think this is a phenomenal wide receiver class. I agree. But don't you think they could trade down a lot, take Daniel Jones, and then get Marquise Brown or... J.J. Arkega Whiteside in the second round. I do think that's a possibility, but it takes two to tango, and I don't know who's going to be trading up to the spot. There are still some good pass rushers left with Montez Sweat and uh, Brian Burns, but I don't have anyone with the desire to trade up this high or the draft capital to trade up to this pick. So I keep Washington where they are, and they take the play that best fits what their needs are. What about Oakland? They give you a potential trade suitor. I think with Oakland scouts being sent home, they have something in their sleeves they want. I think they have their board set up. And if DK's on that board, I think they will trade up to get him. But I don't know if I'm John Gruden, I'm going to risk trading up to just in order to get someone who is a pretty risky prospect this year. Yeah, but I feel like if Oakland does trade up, there's still like a good there's still a good amount of defensive talent. For them to work with, you could get Montez, Christian Wilkins, Simmons, Brian Burns, or even Devin Bush. Even though they got, Devin I think Bush. enough's gonna be available at their um, 24 and 27 for them to be content at those spots because this is such a deep class. But it does fall off a cliff at like the seventh pass rusher. So if they're gonna act, they gotta act soon. But I think that they are content at where they are at. Okay, so. At number 16, you got Christian Wilkins from Clemson going to the Carolina Panthers. I really like this pick. So I'm going to try to go a little bit faster now. So Christian Wilkins, um, obviously they do have an edge press. They do have a edge problem. 
and they have an interior defensive uh, in, a def interior defensive line problem, and the big guy from Clemson will come in and solidify, come in next to Kawan Short, and just go straight up the middle and force them to to go somewhere else because the NFC South has some decent running teams, and I think that they need to stop them. Or actually, I take that back. The NFC South does have some pretty poor running teams, hmm. um, but I do think that. Losing some defensive line prospects and gaining someone who is generational as um, Christian Wilkins, I think the Clemson boys are phenomenal. I really like him. I think he's a good fit in Carolina. Obviously, he did go to Clemson, so they, he's familiar with the area. And I love what he can do as a player. I think he's a good fit for Carolina. Okay. At number 17, this is the Jets from the Giants pick. You have them selecting Montez Sweat. And they did need defensive edge help because they picked Leonard Williams to be their edge of the future, but he didn't turn out there, and they moved him over to defensive tackle. And so what their edge has been has been pretty poor, and I think if they're going to compete in this division, they need some edge pressure. And Montez Sweat is phenomenal. I think he's one of he's the best defensive tackle available, uh, defensive end available, Mike, uh, excuse me, because his speed is phenomenal. He has 4-4-1 speed, and he will get the edge on every tackle, and his combination of length and speed, if you're an unathletic, smaller defensive tackle, he will blow right past you. He will use his reach, push you out of the way, and he will just cut the edge and go straight to the quarterback. My problem is against bigger quarterbacks, uh, bigger uh, offensive tackles, he will disappear because his he has a smaller frame. He's tall and lanky, but doesn't have the mass on his body to really do anything. I think he's to develop his moves. I think he needs to develop it like a swim move or a spin move or a, a or a combo, like I said with the um, with the bull rush. I think he needs to develop that a little bit more before I can tell him as a generational talent. But he has the intangibles to be a great player with his size and with his speed. And this is a position of need for the Jets. Win win everywhere. All right. So now we got Minnesota, and they're taking Garrett Bradbury. So Minnesota, they have one position of weakness, and that's offensive line. And Garrett Bradbury is a phenomenal guard out of NC State, six three, three hundred pounds. And I think Garrett, he's my twelfth guy on my big board. He's the best available, as I have um, obviously Jeffrey Simmons. I'll get to him later. ACL is a big problem, but he is a top five pick when healthy. But he's my biggest, best guy available, and just who happens, the Vikings need offensive line help desperately. Look, he, Dalvin Cook was struggling last year to get any separation or any holes on that offensive line. Losing Pat Eifel is going to be a big loss as well, so they need to replace him soon, and I think that they're going to be doing that with Garrett Bradbury, who is my best prospect available. And speaking of Jeffrey Simmons, you have him at number 19 to the Tennessee Titans absolute steal. I think they needed to go to a playoff team that could sit him until he's ready for him to come in during playoff times and come in. And Tennessee was almost that playoff team last season, and they made some great free agent moves to be that team. They solidified their interior of the offensive line, which is a phenomenal move for them because that was their position of weakness because they had their tackles figured out. Derek Henry's finally emerging, and I think alongside... Um, What's his name? It's a, it's a tackle out of Tennessee. I'm blanking completely. Big guy. Um, oh, how am I forgetting his name? Jarrell Casey. Um, Jarrell Casey, yes. Alongside Jarrell Casey, Jeffrey Simmons will develop his game because he is a top five talent. He is amazing. I have him eight on my big board because of that injury. But when healthy, he is phenomenal. And Tennessee has the patience to let him develop. And... I don't have any positions of need outside of receiver, and I don't feel comfortable taking a receiver ahead of Jeffrey Simmons. He's too good to pass on, and that's why they have to take Jeffrey Simmons here. Phenomenal, phenomenal player. And another guy that looks like a steal, in my opinion, Devin Bush to the Pittsburgh Steelers. I have him number 10 on my, back, my big board. He is falling to 20. Phenomenal steal here for the Steelers. Perfect inside middle linebacker replacing Shazier if he doesn't come back healthy. And if he does, that linebacking core, TJ Watt, Ryan Shazier, and Devin Bush, who is also freaky athletic like Devin White, everywhere on the field. 
football IQ. He has the football instincts. He's the desire to play. I love Devin Bush. He's my second uh, middle linebacker prospect. I love. I think he'd be maybe ahead of Roquan Smith last season. Big if, but I love him. I love him as a prospect. And for the Steelers, he is absolutely perfect. That defense already good, and he is going to put it over the edge. I would have liked him to see. Would have liked them to take um, Hollywood Brown. Kind of be funny there. They take Antonio Brown's cousin to replace him. Yeah. I thought that would have been a good pick, but it's too you can't pass on Devin Bush at this spot, and he'd be perfect as a Steeler. Yeah, I totally agree with this. He has. He's a little bit smaller than Devin White, but he had very similar combine measurements, and I feel like he could develop into a very versatile linebacker in Pittsburgh. And you have the Seattle Seahawks taking Brian Burns. Is this going to be a consolation for losing Frank Clark? Th this is a direct. I had to readjust my big more in my draft because of that trade that happened last night. So what I did is I... <coughs> <coughs> Took the best available. <coughs> <coughs> Starting up. <coughs> Good. One second. <coughs> this is a direct result of them losing Frank Clark in the trade. This is a position of need, and they're leaving Bobby Wagner all by himself in the defense. They have no defensive pressure right now, and Brian Burns is the best defensive end prospect available on my big board, and they need edge help desperately, and I think that after his injury, he came back, was kind of sluggish, but the talent is there to be a phenomenal player. I think Br Brian Burns can be one of the top defensive prospects in the league. I think in any other draft, unless he would have been a top 10 pick, um... Getting my 21 is an absolute steal, and this this is a position of need for the Seahawks, so it makes the perfect situation for him to come in and thrive. And remember, Brian Burns is pretty versatile. He can play the edge, but he's also got an outside linebacker, so I think that's going to be really nice. At 23, you have the Houston... I mean, at 22, you have the Baltimore Ravens selecting A.J. Brown. Damn. Um... This is the position of need for the Ravens, and they have my best receiver on the big board still available. Um, A.J. Brown, I've got 33. This is a bit of a reach, 11 slots too high. But A.J. Brown and D.K. Metcalf is the best receiving duo we've seen since OBJ and Juice. So I think that this is a phenomenal player, and this is perfect for uh, Lamar Jackson. He's great at the shorts route. He's going to get open. He's going to get that short speed, that short acceleration. Six foot three. He's got the size. He's 225. He's got the frame. He's going to be big. He's going to go up and get the ball. Doesn't matter where it is. He's got the speed and size to go get it. And Lamar Jackson is a decent passer. Nothing phenomenal. And I don't think people are talking about DK. I don't think that he's going to have the accurate deep ball to throw it to DK make him effective. And that's why I think AJ Brown's a better fit for the Ravens. I think he's the best fit of all the receivers available. I think they don't need a deep threat, and A.J. Brown could be that short-range guy, as well as stretching the field when he wants to, and I think he's the best of both worlds for the Ravens. Yeah. At number 23, you have the Houston Texans selecting Dalton Risner, and I really like this pick. I think O-line is a big issue for them, and Lamar Miller is not a bad back, but there's been so many O-line problems. I think that... Um, Dalton Risner will definitely come in and help and make an immediate impact. At Kansas State, he allowed one sack last season with over 300 more snaps than any other offensive tackle. I love what Risner's done as an offensive prospect. He's my best available offensive lineman. I think that he's going to be perfect for what the Texans are trying to do. And Deshaun Watson, we haven't seen him with the good offensive line. Imagine that. That's the scariest thought I'm thinking of. You protect this man, imagine what he can do. And he's going to have Will Fuller back. He's going to have DeAndre Hopkins. I think this is going to be a scary, scary team. And I think to make this an actual playoff contender and actually go far in the playoffs, they need to solidify the offensive line because their division is getting really tough because every single team, in my opinion, can make the playoffs this season. And that's why I think taking an offensive lineman and Dalton Risner is the most important priority they can have. Yeah. Now we have Oakland again from Chicago after trading away Khalil Mack. They take safety Jonathan Abrams out of, Mich out of Mississippi State. 
I know you really like this I mean, guy. I love Jonathan Abrams. I watch a lot of Mississippi State football, and he's not just a box safety. He's great in coverage as well. I think he's going to be perfect alongside LaMarcus Joyner and solidifying the secondary for the Raiders. I think alongside Devin Bush, this is a freaky, freaky defense that they're putting together. I love what he can do, and his trash talk is going to be perfect in Oakland until they move to Las Vegas, and then it's going to be whatever. But for Oakland, he has the Oakland mentality. He is going to be phenomenal there. I love Jonathan Abrams. He is my best safety in this draft class, and that's why you have to go take him. And pity for Eagles fans, because I was going to have him here until I rearranged the draft because of that Frank Clark trade. Okay. At number 25... You have the Philadelphia Eagles selecting Jonah Williams. Do you think that do you think that they should have gone and addressed their secondary instead? Um, I liked Craven LeBlanc a lot when I saw him. I think he's going to be a great cornerback. I think he could be a Pro Bowler this year, surprisingly. I don't think that that's the biggest problem they have. Um, but their offensive line is not getting any younger. And I think that the versatility Jonah has, he can play as guard or play tackle. And with their big name tackles. Um, going into their back nine, I think he's going to be a great replacement for Jason Peters, who is 35 now. They signed on that one-year contract. So next season, he's going to come in and be their starting tackle, or he can play starting guard because he is a natural guard. But I think he's going to be perfect for the Eagles, and they need to be building this offensive line back up because Carson Wentz cannot take one more hit. Yeah, yeah. The Eagles' O-line is getting older, and I think Jonah Williams... Is definitely gonna help and remember a few months ago he was projected as a top 15 pick so he's fallen back a little bit but I think he could be another seal now you have the Indianapolis Colts selecting Amani or Arroyo um, Amani or Arroyo is my um, one of my favorite corners in this draft class coming out of Penn State I think that he is a phenomenal player he is 6-1 he's got the size 204 got the frame and for Indianapolis, I think this is the perfect player. And those are because they didn't go after any quarterbacks in free agency because they knew that they could take a guy like Amani, Amani in the first round of this year's draft class. And they, Chris Ballard is the best GM in football, or one of the best GMs. And he's a phenomenal talent evaluator. And I think they will see that in Amani Arnaware. And he's a phenomenal corner, and I love what he can do for the team. And he's shown his ability in man and in zone, and so I think that he's going to be perfect for the Colts. Watch out for him because he's going to be scary on the secondary, which they needed help. And I think if they needed one position of need, I think cornerback would be their one issue that needed to be solved. And they've done that here. Yeah. Now, Oakland is once again boosting their, bolstering their defense with Cleland Furl out of Clemson. I really like this pick. He's definitely gone under the radar a little bit. But I like, I like the fact that Oakland is taking him this late. I mean, Cleveland Furl alongside uh, who I already have them taking and Devin White and Jonathan Abrams solidifies this defense because this was an awful defense. I'm not even going to put it in any light. This was a bad defense. Bad. They needed a pass rusher after getting rid of Khalil Mack, and Cleveland Farrell could be the guy. He's the defensive end out of Clemson, 6'5", 260, and he is a phenomenal player. I love all three of the Clemson boys. They could all be top 15 picks. He's my best available on my draft big board at 22. And this is a steal for the Raiders here. I love Cleveland Farrell here. Absolutely phenomenal pick here. Yeah. And now you have the LA Chargers selecting Jerry Tillery. Tillery is a guy that's gone under the radar out of Notre Dame. I love what he's done. He's a phenomenal player. And I think he's just slipped under the radar. 6'5", 306. And... On this really small, lightweight defense the Charger runs, they need a guy in the middle to stop the run. And they weren't getting that this season. And I think Jerry Taylor could come in alongside Melvin Gordon and Joey Bosa and create the scariest front in football. And Jerry Tillery is capable of making this the most complete defensive unit in football. The Chargers have the best roster in football, and Jerry Tillery just pushes it over the edge. I love this pick. I do think they're going to need to get a quarterback, but I do have them addressing that issue later in the draft. So I love this pick in Jerry Tillery. He's going to be a perfect fit for the team. Now we have Seattle with a pick that I personally really like from Kansas City, 
or like this, the pick was from Kansas City. The Seahawks take Nikhil Harry out of ASU. Nikhil Harry is my uh, fifth receiver on my big board behind Marquise Brown, but I don't think the Seahawks need a deep threat because they have Tyler Lockett to stretch the field, and I have that big guy in Nikhil Harry who has 27 on the bench press. He's fallen because he doesn't have that pure speed like most players do, but what he can do as a player is absolutely phenomenal. He's got the size 6 foot 3, 216, and he's strong. He's physically going to go up and get the ball. And Russell Wilson needs the help. He signs this big money deal, and they're going to need some cheaper players to surround him with. I think the receiving core of Doug Baldwin, Tyler Lockett, and Nikhil Harry will be perfect for Russell this offseason. Moving on to Green Bay, they add another um, weapon for Aaron Rodgers, Noah Fant. Noah Fant is going to be perfect for Matt LaFleur because he loves an athletic tight end, and Noah Fant is the most athletic tight end in this draft. And Jimmy Graham's on the back nine, and they were trying to cut him at the beginning of the offseason. They couldn't get a trade partner, and so they kept him on the team for one last year. But once they get his long-term replacement in Noah Fant, Say bye-bye, Jimmy Graham, because this guy is special. And with Aaron Rodgers, I love what I've done with the Packers. Personally, uh, Akeem Butler alongside Devontae Adams and their already good young receiving core with um, uh, Marquez Valdez-Scantling. I think Noah Fan completes Aaron Rodgers' dream team, but he does have distrust with younger players, and that could be a problem we see here. But Noah Fan's too good of a player to pass up on. Moving on to pick number 30, we have, I mean 31, we have the LA Rams selecting Jamel Dean. This is a bit of a shocker to me because a lot of people I mean, have Jamel him, Dean is my... A lot of people have him going on and going in in later rounds. I mean, Jamel Dean is my biggest reach in this draft class. But the thing is, is that people sleep on him because of his knee injuries. But what he's, his production last season was phenomenal as well as his intangibles is incredible and with um, both Tlaib and Peters' contract coming out this offseason they can't pay him both so having a long-term replacement in Jamel Dean will be perfect for them he did fall because of those three knee injuries he's had but in the last two seasons he said he had two picks last year and nine pass breakups the year before that he had eight pass breakups and his speed is phenomenal he has 4-3 speed 16 bench press 41 vertical he has the speed, size, strength, and everything that you want out of a corner. He has above average size and speed, carries proportional frame. He has lateral quickness. He's physical and crowding. He's got acceleration, and he consistently harasses and goes up for those 50-50 balls. He sinks and stutters his feet for sort of every change of direction, and he allowed less than 40% completion rate in 2018. And out of a corner, that's what I want. That's the most impressive stat I've seen so far this draft. Less than 40% completion rate in 2018. And in the NFL, that's going to be perfect. He's got long arms to punch and separate from blocking receivers. And he's so fast. He can also be a special teamer as a gunner. I love what he's done. But there is a lot of red flags with his knee injuries. But the Rams can take a risk with the phenomenal roster they have. And they need a quarterback for the future alongside... Uh, Nikhil Robbie Coleman. Finally, to round out the first round, we have the Patriots selecting Darnell Savage. Why did you pick Savage instead of someone like Irv Smith Jr., who would be the replacement to Gronk? I don't think that Irv is a perfect replacement for what Belichick wants to do, but Darnell Savage is. He is an athletic Devin McCourty. He is absolutely a great, versatile player. He can play anywhere in the secondary. He's got 4-3-6 speed. He's got incredible intangibles. But his strengths are what you want. He's got twitchy and urgent muscles, and he can just go across the field. He's fluid and natural. He has above-average IQ. I think it's a little bit higher than that. He has great burst to close speed. And he, he has seven interceptions over the last two seasons. Two of them have gone for touchdowns. So he has that big playability. And he thrives off man coverage from the slot. And he's got the speed to cover anybody. I think of this Patriots scheme, he will be perfect in their amoeba defense. And with his versatility, it will be perfect. And I love this fit for Jamel. I think he goes under the radar because he goes 
I mean, for Darnell because he goes to Maryland. But I think for the Patriots, this is the perfect Patriots player. All right, we have now rounded out the first round of the uh, of Will's NFL mock draft for his opinion. All right, Will, uh, are we gonna go to the second round or are we gonna go to mine? We'll do the second round really quick. That is to say their names and why they need their player. Okay, okay. So now we're gonna move on to the second round, starting with pick number thirty-three. Arizona selects Chris Lindstrom. Um. They they need offensive line help to protect whoever they have at quarterback. So, you can't really blame Josh Rosen for having a bad season. He had no help. The offensive line was battered. And Boston College's uh, Lindstrom is my best player available on my big board. And for them to get him here is a phenomenal steal. And I think what they need is that solid interior offensive lineman. And Chris Lindstrom will be perfect for them. All right, you got Indianapolis selecting another corner, Julian Love. Um, that's their one weakness. I think Julian Love will come alongside Amarni Arnawaray and create this young tandem of cornerbacks. We saw this with Carolina picking, uh, with um, Green Bay picking two cornerbacks in the first two rounds with Jair Alexander, Jair Alexander and Josh uh, Jackson. So I think this will be the same combination that they did last se- or the Packers did last season, and it paid out well for them with Jair becoming a phenomenal player. And so Julian Love out of um, Notre Dame will be a great player for them. I think what he has with size and speed, or not size, but what he has with speed will be phenomenal for this team. Moving on to Oakland, they take Josh Jacobs out of Alabama, the running back. With Marshall Lynch retiring, I think this is a perfect fit for them. They need a running back desperately, and for a first-round talent player to drop to them at the second round is absolutely a dream situation. I didn't have any team with a pressing need at running back besides the Raiders, and so they felt confident that they can take him in the second round, and that's why I have him falling so far. I have him as my 24th-ranked player. I think Josh Jacobs is a great prospect, and He doesn't have the usage that he's had to be, he hasn't been beat up yet, which is a problem, but he has fresh legs, and he will be great in the NFL, perfect for the Raiders, position of need. Derek Carr needs as much weapons as he can get. All right, moving on to San Francisco. They take receiver Debo Samuel. Another player I have ahead of Hollywood, uh, Hollywood Brown. But that is only because they don't need a deep threat because they have Marquise Goodwin. Uh, Debo will come in in the slot, will be perfect for Jimmy Garoppolo to get his passes off so he doesn't make any irrational decisions like he did scrambling and tearing his ACL. I think having a slot receiver ahead of Trent Taylor will be perfect for what Kyle Shan is trying to do. And I think Debo out of South Carolina will be a perfect fit for them. All right, moving on, we have Eric McCoy to the New York Giants. I mean, <laughs> they still need offensive line help. They did solidify it, and I think they can push him out to tackle, but he is an interior offensive lineman. And with Kevin Zeitler, Willie Hernandez, and Nate Solder, I think they create a great offensive line. Not great, but infinitely better than they had last season. And Saquon was phenomenal with that offensive line. Imagine what they could do with this offensive line, which could be a top-half offensive line in football, with Kyler as the quarterback, scary, scary offense. Defense is a big issue, though. All right, moving on to Jacksonville. They take Daniel Jones, which is a bit of a shocker because they just signed Nick Foles. Why do you have Jones going to Jacksonville? I don't think Nick Foles is a long-term prospect, even though he's on a four-year contract. I think they're still looking for that quarterback in the future, and with Daniel Jones falling to the second round, you can't pass on him, and they don't have any glaring positions of ease besides receiver. And I don't think they need another fast guy because they drafted the Chark last season who didn't work out for them perfectly. But I think what they need is a long-term prospect because I don't think Nick Foles is going to serve all four years. He's going to get paid till he's 37. I don't know if that's perfect for the Jags. And he's going to fall off a little bit because he was a perfect fit for Philadelphia. I don't know how he'll fit with Jacksonville. So I think getting a long-term heir with Daniel Jones will be perfect for what they need going long-term. All right, moving on to pick 39, we have Greedy Williams. 
I like Greedy. He has good size and speed, but he's falling hard in mock drafts because of his inconsistency. And LSU cornerbacks are great, so I don't know why he's falling so far. I have him falling just because I don't trust him as much as I trust the other corners ahead of him, and that's why I'm falling to Tampa Bay. But they need a corner, and he will be perfect in matching up against Calvin Ridley and uh, Traquan Smith and guys like that next season for Tampa Bay. All right, we have the Buffalo Bills selecting Jalen Ferguson out of Louisiana Tech, the sack leader. The sack leader, Jalen Ferguson, bit of a pro, bit of a stretch to have him seeing here. Most people see him as a third round prospect, but his sack numbers are misleading, and I don't put any numbers into your stats from college. They don't translate to the NFL, but he is impressive nonetheless because. What he is as a player is insanely active. He has the versatility and uniqueness to go anywhere. He recorded an impressive high production over all four years, so he's consistent with his production. More than 27% of his career tackles were for a loss. He's bigger and bigger every year, and that's important to see as he's gaining and trying to work harder to be a better player. He's quick to diagnose a play, and which is extremely important with that football IQ. And he's able to unhinge from blocks with spin moves, which is extremely important with his violent hands. He's able to get past blockers and go to the quarterback, which is an extremely important trait. And I don't have any defensive end ranked as a potential starter behind Jalen Ferguson. So if I am um, Buffalo and I need an edge, this is the guy I'm going to get because there's going to be no one else besides him lower in the draft. So he's going to be perfect for what Buffalo is trying to do. With him and Sean McDermott, possibilities are endless. What about Rashawn Gary? I feel like he'd be a potential starter. Rashawn Gary is a guy like that, but I something about Rashawn Gary, I don't like what he's done. And I don't think he, he will get to the play and mess everything up for the quarterback, but I don't trust that his production will get past offensive tackles in the NFL. I don't think that he will translate well to the NFL. And I think that it was a product of a system and that Devin Bush was making him look like a better product than he was. That's why I've been falling low in the draft. But I think Rashawn Gary has the upside, but I don't trust him as an immediate starter. Okay. And at number 41, we have Dawson Knox going to Denver. Plainly enough, he, their new quarterback, Daniel Jones, or um, their new quarterback, Drew Locke, needs someone to throw to outside of the guy they drafted last season in uh, Cortland Sutton. Drew Locke needs someone to throw to besides Cortland Sutton. And Dawson Knox out of uh, Ole Miss is perfect. I love what he's done as a player. He's developed in the passing game from a blocking tight end, which is how these best players are forming nowadays. I think Dawson Knox will be perfect. <clears throat> Okay, moving on to Cincinnati, we have Chauncey Garner-Johnson, safety out of Florida. He's my best safety available. Cincinnati needs safety desperately, and that's why I've been taking them, uh, ch taking uh, Chauncey at this pick. He's a great player, and for their value and positions of need, which is basically anywhere in the defensive front, or uh, I mean anywhere in the defenses they need players, and so getting someone as good as Chauncey can be is extremely important. That's why I've been taking him. You would take Chauncey Gardner Johnson over Deontay Thompson. I know he. I know Thompson is an inconsistent tackler, but still, he has the athleticism and definitely the uh, intangibles and the high and the uh, potential to become a Pro Bowl safety. I think it's just more of a scheme fit that I, why I have Cincinnati taking Chauncey over Deontay because I have Deontay as a better player. I just have a better scheme fit with Chauncey with Cincinnati. All right, moving on to Detroit, we have Rocky Sin out of Temple. Rocky Sin is the most solid, fundamentally corner out of anyone in this draft. Great feet, great hands. Um, Detroit needs somebody as Darius Lay's contract's coming up next season. And even if they re-sign Darius, they have a hole alongside him. And I think Rocky Sin will come in and fill that hole immediately. And now we have Green Bay, who selects for Sean Gary. I think Mike Patton needs somebody as first as Rashawn Gary. I think he's perfect for his scheme, and this is a perfect position for Rashawn to fall to. I can see them taking Rashawn in the first round, 
but personally, I don't take Rashawn highly because I don't value him as a player as highly as most people do. But for this value and the pick, I think Rashawn will be a great player for the Packers. Moving on to Atlanta, this one's a bit of a shocker. LJ Collier from TCU. You should and love this. I know this. You... you should love this. Huh? LJ Collier is an underrated player, and I think what he can do for you guys is going to be phenomenal coming out of TCU. He's rough, he's rugged, he's aggressive with power to set a strong edge on the outside. He strikes with quick extension, and he has uh, great hands, and they're violent, and he can get past players with great moves, and he's a sleeper in this draft. You look at his film and see how disruptive he is. Um, he only had one season as a full-time starter, but I do think that he showed enough to be taken this highly. And you guys need edge help because Vic Beasley has been disappointing after that Super Bowl season. Yeah. And I think that LJ Collier will be perfect for you guys. I think um, I think you will be loving LJ Collier in a couple of years' time if you guys draft him. So he's, my, yeah. he's one of my sleepers in this draft. And so I, I hate this for you guys because I'm a Saints fan, but you should love this pick. Now, do you think that we could select him third round? I do think you could, but I wouldn't risk it because he's such a great player in my opinion. All right, moving on to Washington. We got Hollywood Brown pairing up with DK Metcalf. Okay, I, I was having a little bit too much fun with this. This was, this is amazing combination. Marquise Brown teaming up with DK Metcalf to make the two scariest young receiving core duo in the league. He, they need a quarterback now to throw to them because this combination of speed and pure athleticism is going to need a great quarterback. I have him falling 17 spots because I couldn't find a guy that needed a speed receiver. And so Washington, with that receiver problem that they had, uh, they, they just had to take him. And now that they need a quarterback to throw to him, I think that's next year's problem. Tank for Tua, that, maybe. Justin Herbert coming in? Maybe. Now, moving on to Carolina, they select DeAndre Baker, and in the previous round, they selected Christian Wilkins, and that's what I actually wanted Atlanta to do two picks earlier, take Wilkins um, on our D-line, and then maybe get DeAndre Baker, or for really lucky, greedy. I think <laughs> DeAndre out of Georgia will be a great player because his coverage ability will be perfect to pair up against um, the corner they drafted last season out of LSU, forgetting his name. But what he's done out of Georgia has made himself one of the best prospects, and he won all types of awards for his ability at Georgia. I think his game translates well. He's being forgotten about quite a bit. He does have the first-round ability, but I wouldn't take him that highly. I think he's a more second-round player, and for Carolina, he's a perfect fit. All right, moving on to Miami, one of my favorite players, Deontay Thompson, a guy that looked like a top 10 pick earlier on in the season, then kind of fell off like really hard. Now, do you think this is going to be a big steal? I think this would be a phenomenal steal, and this will pair up the two Alabama safeties and Mika Fitzpatrick and Deontay Thompson, and in his scheme of Brian Flores' scheme, perfect fit, love it. We got, Cle we got the Cleveland Browns selecting Charles Omenhu. I mean, they still... I don't trust Sheldon Richardson and um, um, Larry Angiobi to fill in on this defensive line. And the most important thing you could have when you're making a quote-unquote Super Bowl push is to have defensive line depth. And the Browns don't have that right now. And so by getting Charles, I think that they could have an incredible depth. And that's what's important. You need, you need seven, eight guys that can all play regular minutes. Um, but that's the problem here. The Browns don't have that. That's why I don't have them as a Super Bowl contender this season. And that's why they need to draft on the defensive line. Moving on to Minnesota. They bolstered their O-line with Cody Ford out of Oklahoma. Another guy that looked like a first-round talent but kind of fell off. I mean, Cody Ford was the anchor to that best offensive line in football. And I think going to Minnesota alongside their other pick that they had, that I had them taking, 
with um, Garrett Bradbury. Garrett Bradbury. I think they will solidify their offensive line, and Kirk Cousin is poised to explode this season. He has all the weapons and all of the defense to have a great year this year, and he has all the talent to do so. I think this is the year of Kirk Cousins, and solidifying the offensive line is their first priority. Moving on to the Tennessee Titans, they got Jeffrey Simmons first round, now they got J.J. Arkega whiteside from Stanford. I like this pick. He's a big vertical threat. Uh, J.J. is one of my favorite receivers. He's a bit of a steal, but he has height and he's got speed, uh, play strength, I mean. Um, I love what he does. He's strong going up to the route. He's a great red zone receiver, and he puts corners on his back and on his hip, and he will get separation in any way he wants to, and I think what he does well will fit up with the team's need, and I really think that J.J. Kager Whiteside will be a great player for Tennessee because Mariota or Brian Tannehill, whoever they need, they need more receiver depth outside of Corey Davis, and so getting my best receiver available in J.J. Kager Whiteside is going to be a phenomenal pick for them. Now we got Pittsburgh taking another linebacker, Mac Wilson out of Alabama. I mean, Mac. <laughs> does have some off-the-field issues, and he's falling in draft boards. But his on-the-field talent is phenomenal. You can't ignore that. And it's a Steelers move to take someone with high risk, high reward, because he's such a great prospect. And so Mack will, will come alongside Devin Bush and TJ to make one of the best linebacking courts in football, and I will love this defense. And Mike Tomlin is going to have a great year if this draft happens. Now, do you think that Mac Wilson will kind of fall off like uh, Reuben Foster, another talented Alabama linebacker that had too many off-the-field issues to where his career has definitely fallen off a lot? I mean, he still has all the talent to be a great player, but we'll see how Reuben adapts in Washington. But I think he still has the talent to be a great player, but he's not going to be living up to that first-round hype anymore. But he does have the talent... Well, let's see if his motor and drive will take All right, him moving... to the next level. Yeah. Uh, Philadelphia takes Voshan Joseph, another uh, another guy that's soaring up your draft board. I mean, after losing a Brooks, they need linebacker help desperately. And Voshan Joseph out of Florida will be the perfect player for that. Because Voshan, in my opinion, is another one of those sleeper players. Because what Voshan does is he will get... Anywhere you want him to go. He he has explosive energy. He's diverse in production. And what he does is he has quickness to get past guards. And out of the linebacker spot, I really trust him to get to the second level and make a play on the running back or quarterback. And he's got that initial quickness to recognize the play and stop it before it happens. And Voshan Jefford... Joseph's instinct will be a great player and he should help in coverage as well and his blitz pickup is great I love him on blitz potentials on third down I think he's going to be a great player for Florida I mean great play for the Eagles alright moving on to Houston we have a first round talent going all the way to 54 Irv Smith Jr. out of Alabama I mean Irv out of Alabama is one of my favorite prospects he has football family, which is important. You can't teach that. And he will be perfect for Deshaun Watson. They needed a tight end, and Irv just fell to them, and they will gladly take him up and have this great tight end and make Deshaun Watson have one of the best weapons in all of football. And they have back-to-back -back picks. They pick Greg Little. I mean, I, I'm really giving Deshaun Watson his birthday party here. Because Greg Little out of Ole Miss is one of the better offensive tackles. We're solidifying his offensive line while getting a fun weapon. And this is what the Texans were missing last year without their first round pick. And now that they have young players to build around their young core, they can really make something interesting this year because they have the talent, all the talent, to make a run this year. Now we have New England um, selecting Jay Sternberger. Does this look like Bronx replacement? I mean, it's not a Gronk replacement, but Jay Sternberger is one of the tight ends that I value so highly because of his versatility. He can block and receive, which is an important value for the Patriots because of their scheme. And I think Belichick will get the best out of Jay Sternberger. And 
6'4", he's got a good size, and he's had great production at Texas A&M. He's been really intriguing to watch, and I think he's a Bill Belichick-type player to draft. As I said, I went very New England for New England's picks. Moving on to Philadelphia, again, they select David Montgomery out of Iowa State. I don't think Jordan Howard's their long-term back, and if they can get their se my second-best running back prospect in this draft all the way down here at 57, I think you have to take it because David Montgomery has shown great production out of Iowa State, and what I really like about these later-round running backs is that I've done the math because all of these third- and second-rounders have had phenomenal coverage, uh, phenomenal production in the NFL. In 2017, there was around, there was 13 running backs taken in, or in the second to seventh round. And I did the math. I added the rushing yards last season for all of them, which is a combined 13,000. There are nine starters found in the second or later rounds in 2017, and there's four second options. They had a combined average of 1,000 yards and eight touchdowns. And the production you can get out of running backs in these rounds is so phenomenal for the value of pick you get. I don't think it's even worth taking a first-round running back unless they're a generational talent because you could get some great players. Dalvin Cook, Joe Mixon, Alvin Kamara, Kareem Hunt, DeAndre Foreman, James Conner, Samadji Pirine, Tariq Cohen, Jabal Williams, Marlon Mack, Aaron Jones, Elijah McGuire, and Chris Carson. I mean, that list alone scares me because... If that's the 2017 draft, this draft should have at least four or five guys in the second and third round, and David Montgomery is well capable of being one of those guys. Another guy that could be uh, like that is Damian Harris, who's going to Dallas from Alabama. I think the usage they had on Ezekiel Elliott was too high, and Damian Harris will come in as a workload back and alleviate some of that stress off Ezekiel Elliott. I think along that great offensive line, he will thrive. I think as he'll be an upgrade on Rod Smith as a backup running back, and I'll be really excited to see how this combination will work. And they did draft the Alabama running back last year. What was his name? The out of the, in the sixth round, Bo. Oh, Bo Scarborough. They drafted Bo Scarborough last year, but Damian Harris is a lot better of a prospect than Bo. All right, moving on to Indianapolis, they're selecting Jakai Polite. Someone who actually looked like maybe an early second round pick, but had a terrible combine and some terrible pre-draft workouts and interviews. I mean, <coughs> his talent cannot be questioned. And Indianapolis, I think that they'll see his talent without... They, they ignore... I mean, Chris Bob will ignore what everyone else is thinking and pick the player that's best for his team. And they need an edge. And... His on-the-field production cannot be questioned, and that's why I love him so much as an Indianapolis Colts player. That's why I like Chris Ballard so much is because he'll ignore what people are people are thinking because your intangibles are not everything. You, I care more about your on-the-field production, and that's why he'll be a perfect player for the Colts. Moving on to the L.A. Chargers, we have Michael Dieter out of Wisconsin. The Chargers, I don't think that they have the greatest interior of the offensive line with uh, Lamp and with um, uh, Russell Akung, or Akung is a tackle, but they, I, don't, I don't think they have the greatest depth on the offensive line, and if they really want to protect Philip Rivers, because he is getting up there in age, I think they're going to need to invest in the offensive line, and having someone this good fall to them, I think is incredible value for them. I think... He is one of the better offensive line prospects. And after this, the offensive line would go a little bit downhill from here. But I think they have good value in um, Michael Deiter. Moving on to Kansas City, they select the FCS boy, Nasir Adderley. Um, I really like Nasir Adderley. And alongside Tyran Matthew, I think it will be a great safety combination. Because what the Chiefs need right now is secondary help. Because they... They kind of fixed their defensive line with the Frank Clark trade, and they've given up their long-term assets, so they're going to need to be frugal with their cap space, and Nasir Adley is the perfect guy to do that. And you got the Saints, this seems a little biased, selecting the speedster Paris Campbell. I, <coughs> it's a perfect Ted Ginn replacement, and Paris Campbell falling this far, same with, with, with um, 
Marquise Brown. I didn't think a team needed a speedster wide receiver that much, and that's why he fell 15 spots on my big board. But I love Paris Campbell. These Ohio State receivers were the best receiving core in all of the all of the NCAA last season, and they all fell because they weren't getting the, the getting the workload because they were all so great. So this in turn made all of these guys' value fall. But if the Saints can get Paris Campbell. He's my best player available on the big board, and they get a great value out of this. Moving on to Kansas City again for the Rams. They select Justin Lane, cornerback out of Michigan State. I think this is good because they need a lot of secondary help. Alongside Kendall Fuller, I think Justin Lane will be a great prospect because out of Michigan State, I really like what his game's been. I do think the Saints could take him, and I was debating between Paris Campbell and Justin Lane because Justin Lane had a great workout with the Saints and was really admires Marshall Lattimore's game, but I, I don't know if Jeff Ireland values him as much or Mickey Loomis, who will be making the pick on the day two on, on Friday, so I don't know who they'll pick here, but if Justin Lane fell to the Chiefs, I think that they need to solidify their secondary if they want to be considered a Super Bowl contender because they're not going to get past the Patriots because they will exploit your weakness and we saw that in that AFC Championship game, exploiting the Chiefs secondary. Now finally, New England selects Ryan Finley out of NC State. Does this look like a Brady replacement for when he retires in like a million years? I think eventually Ryan Finley has the potential to be a starter in the NFL. I think he will get the best value out of him. Bill Belichick will help a lot with Ryan Philly's development, and I think he can be a good player out of NC State because his talent is there, and he has decent size at six foot three. I think Philly will be a great Patriots player. All right, that's a wrap for the second round. Moving on to round three, starting with Bobby Evans in Arizona. I mean, all these Oklahoma guys are phenomenal, and I think Bobby will be a great fit for Arizona because they need to solidify their offensive line for whoever they have at quarterback. And so that's the first thing you need to do when you have a young quarterback is get an offensive line, and Bobby Evans will do that. And if they draft Kyler, he'll be perfect because the combination of Oklahoma, they know the blocking scheme together, which will make it an easier transition to the NFL. We got Nicole Hardman from UGA to Pittsburgh. <laughs> and <coughs> he's another one of my sleeper guys because – People don't really realize how good he was, but his speed is phenomenal for Pittsburgh, and I think any guy that Pittsburgh drafts will be a phenomenal player in the NFL, and they've made receivers look a lot better than they actually are, and Miko Harmon will be a perfect fit for what they're doing. I'd be excited to see what he does, and for fantasy purposes, draft Miko Harmon if you want a sleeper pick in the 15th round. Moving on to San Francisco, Yanni Kajust out of West Virginia. I remember he was a first-round talent, but he fell off hard. I don't know why it fell so hard, but I, I, I think Yanni could be a, a decent player to protect um, a, uh, um, protect Jimmy Grappolo alongside Ronnie uh, 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 Stanley. What was, what's his name? The, the um, offensive tackle. The, the... Well, anyway, they have Mike McGlinchey, who's their younger guy, and I think alongside um, Mike McGlinchey, I think uh, Yanni Kajuste comes in and be, is that other offensive tackle that they're looking for and to solidify their offensive line because the Niners do have a good roster and can compete if they make the right moves. All right, moving on to the Jets, we got Christian Miller. I mean, any of these Alabama guys you can't really go wrong with because they already play in a pro-style defense and they're already NFL ready. And the Jets, I already have them taking one edge prospect, but they really do need edge help and Christian Miller would be perfect for them. All right, we got Riley Ridley going to Jacksonville. I mean, Riley Ridley, and they do need receiver help. And Nick Foles is going to need someone that's tall. I didn't see a big receiver left available, but 6'2 is plenty enough size, and Riley Ridley does the speed. I think this would be a great combination. It could be like Nathan, Nathan Aguilar, and Nick Foles is not a Nathan Aguilar type of guy. But we'll see how Riley Ridley fits into Jacksonville's scheme. All right, Miles Sanders going to Penn State. I mean, no, a Tampa Bay from Penn State. Miles Sanders is one of my favorite prospects. His versatility is a pass catcher and receiving, a receiving back and a running back. And he could be a Camara-type player in the third round. 
and Tampa Bay is getting a steal with him. And in the NFC South, you need a receiving back. Look at the guys that have prospered. You look at the guys like Kamara and um, Christian McCaffrey. The receiving backs in the NFL are taking over, and he will be a perfect NFL player. I love Miles Sanders. 1,000 yards to total yards next season. No questions asked. Wow, that is a very, very, very bold statement right there. Yes, indeed. We got Denver selecting Quan Thornhill. I think that they're going to need secondary help after the trade request from Chris Harris Jr. And if they don't trade him, they're going to need to protect him deep because he's not going to be as motivated as he is normally. So I think getting someone like um, Juwan Thornhill will be a good outset out of Virginia. I think he showed good promise. But the ACC prospects on the defensive end are suspect. Uh, usually in the secondary. Like, look at Terrell Edmonds last season. I don't think he was a great fit on um, um, Pittsburgh. So, obviously, I don't really trust the ACC in creating great secondary players. All right, David Edwards to Cincinnati from Wisconsin. Bobby Hart's not good enough. No questions asked. Yeah, a new offensive tackle. And David Edwards out of Wisconsin will be a great guy for the Bengals. All right. New England selects Deontay Thompson. Love it. Just, just, just love it. I actually just absolutely love Deontay Thompson coming in. Um, Deontay is a phenomenal player. He gets slapped on because he didn't have a productive year from Toledo this season. But look at his sophomore, his junior year, 1,300 yards. He has the production, and he will be a perfect Patriots player. I love Deontay Thompson for the Patriots. Watch out for him. No matter what team he goes to, he's going to be a steal in this draft. All right, we have Buffalo selecting Trayvon Mullen, cornerback out of Clemson. I mean, without he really shined this season, and I think that he could be drafted a little bit higher. But Buffalo, outside of Tre'Davious White, don't have that great corners. After Vontae Davis retired, they were expecting him to be that other corner. So getting him alongside um, White or Tre'Davious White will be a great cornerback duo. I would love to see that. All right, we got Green Bay selecting Drew Samia. Drew Samia is probably, uh, should be a second round player. I have him falling a little bit. Going to the Packers, though, would be a perfect fit, replacing Brian Bulaga. And I think this offensive line is going to be a complete unit. I can't say this enough. I've, I have made a perfect draft for the Packers. I've been biased to them. But I, I don't like the Packers. I actually kind of dislike the Packers. But I've made such a great draft for them. We have Washington selecting Kelvin Harmon. Another wide receiver. I I've, I might have gone a little bit wide receiver crazy for Washington, but I know one of these guys won't hit, so I at least want two of them to be good players. And Kevin Harmon will be a good inside receiver. Six foot three, he's got good size. And I went for two speedsters before, so they needed to balance this out because they needed to uh, balance out the receiving court because Pierre Garcon was not going to carry the load. So they needed some guy to get the short yardage catches. We got Carolina selecting Chase Winovich. I think he's another guy that is a product of the system, but Chase Winovich will be a great guy out of Michigan. And edge help is going to be crucial. I had him taking a tackle earlier, but they need to replace um, Peppers' production that he's leaving after he retired. Great career he had, but they need edge help, and Chase Winovich will help. We got Miami selecting Darrell Henderson. I love Henderson coming out of um, Memphis. What he's done, getting 1,000 thousand yards, 2,000 yards a season, is phenomenal. I mean, it's the American Conference, but anyways, I love what he's done at, Mich uh, at Memphis. And players have had decent production coming out of the AAC. The AAC and I think Darrell Henderson will be another one of those guys 750 yards will come out of him this season. And for Miami, they need a back because they have not replaced J.H.I.E. yet. And I don't think... Um, um, what's the guy out of Alabama that they have running back-wise? Oh, Kenyon Drake. I don't think Kenyon Drake's the long-term back under Brian Flores. Now we have Atlanta selecting Dremont Jones. So they take their interior defensive lineman in the third round like they did last year. They do have um, Grady Jarrett under a franchise tag, but they need to look elsewhere, and Draymond Jones could be the potential replacement for him if they do decide to let him walk. And I think he can learn a lot from Grady Jarrett, but what do you think about Draymond Jones going to the Falcons? 
I really like this. I think this will definitely help with depth as well because Deidre and Sanat is our uh, next best defensive tackle. And I think he was a rookie last year, so we should get, give him some time to develop. But if he doesn't work, we still have Jermon Jones, who carved out a solid career at Ohio State. Moving on to Cleveland, we have Amani Hooker from Iowa, safety. I mean, they're going to be looking to replace Jabril Peppers, who they moved to free safety at the end of the season. I think Amari Jones can be a good replacement for him. Um, Iowa, <coughs> Iowa has been a decent a, a hit-or-miss um, college for getting defensive prospects out of, but I think Armani Hooker could be a re decent replacement for Jabril Peppers. He won't replace his value, but I think that he could be a decent option. All right, we got... Uh, Minnesota selecting Taylor Rapp out of Washington. Taylor Rapp is going to try and replace Andre Sandejo, and after they let him go, they need another safety help alongside Harrison. Um, um, so I really think that um, Taylor Rapp will be the guy to replace him out of Washington. So I think that Rapp is going to be replacing Andre Sandejo, and it's a position of need because out of anyone in the defensive, a defensive area for the Vikings, they needed another safety. We got Tennessee selecting Ben Powers out of Oklahoma. And this Oklahoma offensive line is absolutely phenomenal. All these guys will be pro ready because this was the best blocking group of any NCAA team. Their scheme was phenomenal, and they needed to solidify their interior offensive line. And they did it with signing of um, that Rams offensive guard, um, uh, blanking on his name, but. They needed to solidify their interior offensive line for Derek Henry to make holes through, and I really think that um, Ben Powers will be the guy to create these holes. We got Pittsburgh selecting Jalen Hurd. I love Jalen Hurd. Um, he came out, transferred, now he's moved from running back to wide receiver, and he has all the upside. He's developing as a receiver. He's only played their position for a couple of years. I think maybe only one or two. And so switching from running back to receiver is a hard transition. And Hurd is going up and up every year. And look at his, his um, increase in production every year. He's learning the position and he's becoming a phenomenal player. He has all the talent in the world. And I think he can be one of the better players in this draft. The Steelers, they're going to get one good receiver. Whether it be him or who they had picking in the other round. Now we have Seattle se selecting Terry McLaurin. Uh, I, I do think Russell Wilson needs more help, and receiver is a big problem with them. And these Ohio State guys are really underrated, and I think Terry could come in and just be a great route runner and get open because that's what he did at Ohio State, and Russell Wilson just needs that easy guy just to dump the ball off to because Doug Baldwin has been that guy, but he might be getting a little bit more covered now because he's a more known commodity. We have Baltimore selecting DeAndre Walker out of Georgia. They they need more edge help after Zadarius left this offseason, and I think DeAndre Walker is a great player out of Georgia, and he showed himself being capable to deliver in big moments, and I think that's why DeAndre will be a good player for Baltimore at 85. Houston selects David Long. Um, I think Houston does need more corner help after the departure of Kareem Jackson, and he played admirably in Michigan and was a good corner for them, and I think he'll be a great player coming into Houston, and we won't have a big role, but I think coming uh, behind, he'll be a third third string corner, and I think he'll to play admirably there, but this is a position of need for Houston, and getting a guy, a, a guy like David Long this low in the draft will be a good steal for them. At pick number 87, Chicago selects Devin Singletary out of FAU, so a small school running back. And we've seen small school running backs have great production, and I think that he has a direct impact in the NFL. Him, Tariq Cohen, and Mike Davis would be a great combination of players. So I think I don't tr they they let go of Jordan Howard because he'd be too expensive in the long run. But I think that he'll be a great option going forward. We got Demarcus Lodge, a wide receiver, to Detroit. So Demarcus Lodge is another guy that I think fell a little bit because of his problems, but I really like Lodge just because what he did at uh, Old Miss as a third option, he really went unnoticed because of that, because he was behind A.J. Brown and D.K. Metcalf. But I think he can be, come in and be a good player for them. 
We got the because they they did they they're still missing Golden Tate replacement. So him and Kenny Galladay, Kenny Galladay will be a good duo. Yeah, um, we got uh, Indianapolis selecting um, another speedy receiver, Andy Isabella. Out of UMass, I just love what he's done. He's consistent. He's going to go get the ball, and they really do need a receiver because after Devin Funches, they they have a really weak receiving core. And to get a third option like Andy Isabella will be perfect for Andrew Luck's play style. Moving on to Dallas, they select Foster Moreau, uh, tight end out of LSU. Um, I believe on him just because of Jeff Ireland, who's the Saints scout, who's been, in my opinion, the best uh, head scout in all of NFL. And so they need a longer place because Jason Wynn is old, and I don't think he's going to be a good production this season. And I don't think that they have their guy... And so Forge Moreau will be a great blocking and then receiving back a receiving time because he's developing on that end. And that's what we've seen the tight ends that are most successful are the blocking tight ends that develop in the receiving game. So I really like Forge Moreau. And let me cut you off. This next pick is phenomenal. Brett Ripon out of Boise State will be the perfect Phillip Rivers replacement. I love Brett Ripon so much. I think he's my fifth, fifth. Um, he's, he's my fifth, no, he's my sixth quarterback on my position rankings, and I just think he's an absolutely phenomenal player, and if I'm a Chargers fan, I'd be fen- I'd be over the moon with this pick. All right, moving on, we got Kansas City selecting Zach Allen. The thing with Zach is that he can play on the defensive end, but he has the body to play defensive tackle, and... He's just such a great player. He could be drafted in the first round. He's that good. I think people are underrated on his talent because I think Zach Allen would be the seal of this draft because he has first-round talent without first-round recognition, and I think he'll fall to the third round. But he's one of my favorite players in this draft, and watch out for him in the long run because Zach Allen, alongside Frank Clark, this is going to be a good defensive defensive front for the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah. Um... No, I pick number 93, the Jets select Elgton Jenkins out of Mississippi State. They they do need interior offensive line help. Austin Mele is going to be by himself. But I think getting another player to, to be backup, and potentially because starter alongside him, is going to be a big plus for the Jets offensive line. The Rams select Blake Cashman out of Minnesota, linebacker. I mean, after the loss of Mark Barron and signing Clay Matthews, I think they're going to need a long-term replacement for both of them. And so, I think Blake Cashman has the potential to be great. And watching him in that bowl game against Georgia Tech was absolutely phenomenal. All over the field, stop the um, the um, Wildcat offense or whatever Georgia Tech run, ran with um, Paul Johnson. But he was phenomenal and just was all over that the best run game in football. And I think that's why it'll translate well for the Rams, because they do need run help. I pick number 95, the New York Jets select Emmanuel Hall, a wide receiver from Missouri. Is this going to be another potential long-term target for Sam Darnold? I mean, he had Drew Locke in college, and didn't he had okay production. But I don't think Locke trusted him enough, and that's why I don't think he's going to be a great receiver in the NFL. But what he's shown... And his stats alone, I think he's going to be able to be an NFL player. I think the Jets could take a risk on him, and I think he'll be a great player for them in the long run. All right, moving on, we have uh, Washington, and they're selecting Dalen Mack. I mean, he's going to be backing up Deron Payne, and I think you can't get enough defensive line help. And they were devastated by injuries on the defensive line last season, and they're going to need this as much as possible. We got New England selecting Elijah Holyfield, running back out of UGA. New England really likes their UGA backs. I think he's going to be an interesting pick because he's he knows a uh, Sonny Michelle, and they have a combination together, and he has a lot of versatility, Elijah, Elijah Holyfield, and I think that he'll be a perfect Patriots player. As I said, I went a very Patriots route for their draft picks this yeah, offseason. Yeah, fun fact, Elijah Holyfield is the son of famous boxer Evander Holyfield. Evander. Jacksonville selects Gerald Willis. Depth. 
that they're, they're losing a lot of key players due to contracts on the defensive front next offseason, the offseason after that. So getting a young guy like Gerald Willis out of Miami is going to be extremely important, and he does have a lot of high-end talent. All right, the L.A. Rams select Josh Oliver, tight end from San Jose State. I think that Gerald Everett isn't the long-term guy that they need. I think Josh Oliver has the upside to be uh, one of Jared Goff's favorite targets. We have Carolina selecting Benny Snell, running back out of Kentucky. His usage rate, I mean, Christian McCaffrey's usage rate was so high last season. They need another back to take the work off of him. And with Jonathan Stewart retiring, they need Benny Snell to take some of the weight off of Christian McCaffrey because he had a 90% usage rate, which is astronomical. So they need to take some of the load off Christian McCaffrey and Benny Snell. New England selects Bobby Okereke out of Stanford. Versatility Patriots, perfect. All right, and Baltimore with a potential steal. Savian Smith out of Alabama. He fell 20 spots. Baltimore snatches. They need a cornerback. Their defense got a little bit weak after the offseason. They lost a couple of key players, but Savion Smith will be a great asset. And we've done three rounds in an hour and a half. So I think I think you'll agree that we, we tried our best here, and this is our first ever mock draft, so... This is a learning experience for us, and we're going to look back here on one year and see how we have done our draft. We're going to look back at our picks and look back at how I did 